Hi, this is Starkey Sowers. Welcome again to another PLUS program training series. This is on bone health and it's part two. In part one, we talked a lot about um, different types of things that actually help with building up bone tissue and bone health and lifestyle factors, as well as um, a couple other different things is like risk factors as well too. So in this particular series, what we're gonna do is we're gonna just kind of look at the nutrients we kind of overviewed, so to speak, in the first section, we'll get a little bit more detail. So it just kind of maybe capstones it or brings it together so you have a, a full attention. So a couple things to remember. Number one, when it comes to bone health, exercise becomes a, a huge key component because it actually stimulates what we call the osteoblast and the osteoclast. So what are the osteoblasts and what are the osteoclasts? Well, first of all, the osteoblasts are cells that are actually in bone tissue. And what they do is they kind of drive the synthesis or the, the building up of bone tissue. And I kind of like to look at the osteoblasts kind of like workers, so to speak, that are building like a block wall. And we kind of use that loosely when we think about bone tissue. Then we also want to feed those osteoblasts uh, with the block wall substances. So you want to give it the calcium, want to give it um, some of the phosphorus and the other components that are necessary. Then we also have some things that maybe antagonize or kind of work along with it, such as like different types of hormones. So we think of like calcitonin and parathyroid hormone those actually kind of work kind of in concert to stimulate the worker to be more effective, so to speak, along with estrogens and progesterones. Um, those things are the things that kind of, once again, kind of stimulate the worker to activate, to wake them up and help them build that bone tissue. Remember also that bone tissue is a large component of protein and amino acids. So it becomes critical as another foundation, so to speak, for the worker to have proteins and amino acids to help to build that bone tissue as well too. All right, so with that said, what we're gonna do is kind of maybe break down each one of those nutrients and have a little bit closer look. And we can't do that without doing calcium first because calcium is like a 90% component of bone tissue. So with that said, well, how much, how much does the body need of calcium uh, each and every day? So one thing to remember is about 1,000 milligrams a day is the average or the United States recommended dietary allowance, so to speak, for calcium. And that's about the average intake that most individuals over the age of 18 will typically seek out or kind of look for. So a couple little caveats with that though. If there's any type of pregnancy, then that actual milligram dosage goes up to 1200 milligram, as well as if there's any menopause, anybody that's menopause or post-menopause, 1500 milligrams becomes the next RDA level. So there's kind of a couple little caveats. So if you're pregnant, you need a little bit more calcium. If you've gone over menopause, then you're gonna need a little bit as well too. So remember, this is not just supplemental calcium. This is a combination of dietary intake along with supplementation to give you those RDA or the United States recommended dietary allowances of calcium. All right, so then we gotta look at magnesium. And magnesium not only helps you increase the absorption of calcium. But the other thing that magnesium does is it activates what we call calcitonin, which is a thyroid hormone. And calcitonin is another hormone that activates the osteoblastic cells or kind of energizes them to be more effective at synthesizing calcium into the bone as well as the, the protein and phosphorus into the bone matrix. So magnesium has a real interesting role again. So remember that the magnesium, the RDA for magnesium is about 400 milligrams a day. It's literally about half of what calcium is. We recommend that you get anywhere from 350 to up to about 600 milligrams of magnesium a day. A couple of unique things about magnesium. There's certain tests that we actually saw that magnesium on its own actually helped to encourage bone tissue growth. So what it does is actually prevents bones from breaking down. So it becomes a real key component, even though we don't see a large amount of it in bone tissue becomes critical when it comes to the utilization of calcium and also for the building of bone tissue and stimulating those osteoblasts to work. Phosphorus is another key component as well. The body has to have phosphorus. Typical intakes are gonna be whole grains and meats. And the typical American diet is usually pretty rich in phosphorus, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day. So it kind of runs right in that calcium range as well too. All right, so then after phosphorus, there is what we call the trace minerals. And some of these trace minerals have some very interesting factors. First of all, zinc and copper kind of help to regulate thyroid metabolism of hormones. The other thing that zinc and copper are needed for is kind of like maybe some ignition switches, so to speak, to kind of make that, that, that bone synthesis start to happen. All right, so then along with that, we also see the trace mineral boron. A lot of research in the last couple of years on boron. So when you look at boron, what it does is it prevents the breakdown of estrogens in the body. So anybody that's postmenopausal definitely want to look at having adequate amounts of boron 
in their daily consumption of either dietary sources or in their supplemental form, whether it's a multivitamin or something of that nature, whether it's got like maybe a calcium formula. So boron becomes critical in that factor. So then the next one would be silica or silicon. And what we know about silica is this, is it increases the flexibility and the tensile strength, so to speak, of those calcium matrices and those bone tissues. And it's absolutely needed to help calcium like cement in, so to speak, into the bone tissue. So silica has gotten a lot of popularity throughout the last couple of years. A lot of people add additional silica or silicon to the diet in a supplemental form to ensure that it's there. Typical food sources of silica is going to be vegetables, especially like cucumber and some of these other different types of nutrients. All right, so then next on the list are the vitamins, vitamins A, vitamin D, and also vitamin K. So let's kind of look at a couple of these like maybe introspectively. Um, we'll have a look, first of all, at vitamin D. And so when we look at vitamin D, vitamin D has gotten so much popularity on so many different things, not only for the immune system, but also for one of the things that, uh, for um, eye health and things of that nature. But one thing that's so unique about vitamin D is this, it's actually what we call the sunlight vitamin. And a lot of people actually want to classify this as a hormone. Remember, a hormone is something that the body makes. A vitamin is something that you have to consume and that the body can't make. So what we know about vitamin D is this, is the body will actually synthesize it when needed. So you've got to get some sunlight exposure. And I think that's going to be one of our roundup tips is make sure that we've got that. All right. So not only does vitamin D increase the absorption of calcium, it also increases the retention of calcium and also helps the, the osteoblast actually deposit calcium. So very critical to have vitamin D. Usually about a thousand I use a day would be the minimal recommendation for somebody that's like working with osteoporosis prevention. All right. So next on the list is vitamin K. What's unique about vitamin K, there's a whole family of vitamin K. There's a K1, there's a K2, and there's some other different vitamin Ks. Well, in the K2 families, there's what is known as an MK4 and an MK7. What we found about this is a lot of people were kind of on the belief that the vitamin K was going to help with the synthesis and the prevention of bone mineral, de bone mineral demineralization. But in actuality, what it does, it helps with the protein structures and helps increase flexibility and the building of bone. So what we do know is it's definitely needed for bone density, but it's not like the driving factor. It's definitely one of the factors that, not, that you want to have with your supplement. Remember also with vitamin K, vitamin K is actually produced in the intestinal system from green leafy vegetables and proper bacteria balance. So having proper bacteria actually be becomes critical in this situation. And finally, vitamin C is necessary for the synthesis of collagen and collagen support. And remember that a large percentage of that bone tissue actually is collagen. All right, so let's wrap this all back up. Just kind of finalize the whole thing. Exercise becomes a key component in stimulating the osteoblast and prevention of osteoporosis. The other thing is you gotta have adequate amounts of calcium, especially food sources such as milk, green leafy vegetables, or those hard vegetable components, as well as uh, soy foods actually have some decent values as well too, including tofu, tempeh, and some of the soy proteins. And then finally, make sure that you're getting adequate amounts of vitamins A, vitamin D, vitamin K, as well as vitamin C to kind of balance that matrix. And then the avoidance, as we were saying, from too much red meat, as well as too much alcohol, and also uh, any types of large amounts of uh, processed sugar become a component that you want to stay away from. So remember the last note, stay active and keep the bones healthy. That becomes a key component in osteoporosis prevention. This is Starkey Sowers. Thanks for watching another Plus Program video from Clark's Nutrition and Natural Foods Market.